Now we're going to move to a more quantitative approach at looking at solutions and concentrations. The previous section was mostly qualitative. And of course, knowing the actual concentration of a solution is very important for lots and lots of different reasons, many of them being medical and health related. You might remember a few years back, the terrible tragedy up in Flint, Michigan, with the contaminants, especially lead, in the water that many, many children were drinking. And of course, that has serious health reper repercussions down the road, especially in the uh, neurological area of our physiology. So it's important to know about concentrations. Think about all the different solutions in our environment. The atmosphere is a solution. The oceans are solutions. Many of the beverages, if it's not pure water that we drink, they're all solutions. Our blood is a, a solution. Um, many, many solutions inside of us and outside of us. And it's important to know their concentrations. As far as our water in the area is concerned, here is the kind of water quality report that you might receive if you lived in West County. This is the one that I received a few years back, right before COVID. Um, you can see the dates here are mostly 2011. And the maximum contaminated level is this column right here. And this column here is the goal. In other words, we would like our water quality to meet this goal and not exceed it. And for the most part, our water in the St. Louis area, broadly speaking, is very, very good. In fact, there's a reason why Anheuser-Busch uh, located here um, because of the very, very clean water. <clears throat> you can see that our water primarily comes from the Missouri River or the Merrimack River. And the Missouri River, of course, joins the Mississippi River just north of St. Louis City. And Merrimack um, joins the Mississippi River uh, later. Uh, it's interesting, if you drive along Clayton Road, not way out in West County, but for the most part, Clayton Road was actually constructed on the borderline um, between where water on the north side of the Clayton Road, if it was able to, would eventually flow into the Missouri, and water on the south side of Clayton Road would eventually flow into the Merrimack. We call that a divide. The Continental Divide, located in the Rocky Mountain area, I know in Yellowstone I'd walk over it all the time in hikes, is the water on the left side would eventually end up in the Pacific and the water on the east side would eventually um, end up in the Mississippi and, uh, and go towards the Gulf and the Atlantic. You can see what the kind of contaminants are as well. We have herbicides for basically getting rid of weeds. Um, we have all kinds of manufacturing processes uh, going on, like uh, refineries and ceramics, electronics, um, we have more electronics down here, metal refineries. Uh, we have natural deposits. So the point being that all the resources we use in manufacturing either come from growing it on the ground or mining it um, in the ground. And so not only do you have your natural sources of stuff that's going to end up in the water, but you have all those things that are the result of um, man-made activities. And so we really want to be careful about this if we're going to be good stewards. It doesn't mean that we don't do nothing. I don't think that's biblical. But it doesn't mean either that we can do whatever we want and not worry about the consequences because that is not good either. Neither of those are biblical. God wants us to be good stewards of the environment that he's given us. You can see also that these contaminants might be liquid, they might be solid, they might also be radioactive, like here. You might notice things like PPB, parts per billion. Here we have parts per million. And so some contaminants 
we are concerned about at the millions level, some at the billions level, maybe even at the trillions level. And of course, the goal is never necessarily to get zero. That's often impossible, but we want to reduce the levels before a level that has been determined to be dangerous. Here is the rest of that chart. You can see some of it is bacterial, uh, from human waste, from animal waste, from sewage treatment plants. It's, we want to take care of the sewage before it gets back into the water. Um, coliform bacteria is naturally found in, in human and animal waste. All right. This leads us to this point. And this picture of a green viper that is poisonous should uh, grab your attention. In Latin, the phrase is sola dosis facet venenum. You might recognize the word venom or poison coming from here. Facet means to make or facet. Um, a facility, uh, to facilitate something is to make it happen better. Here's the word dose and here's the word only. Only the dose makes the poison. It's not what it is that's dangerous, it's how much there is that is dangerous. And way more people die from getting too much water than from getting too much um, snake venom. And water, you know, you get too much water, for example, and you can drown. So, we use the word concentration all the time, but that's a relative term that also depends upon what the solute is um, and how much solvent there might happen to be. We use the word dilute when there's very, very small amounts of solute, and we use the word concentrated when there's large amounts of solute. But again, those are kind of qualitative. So what constitutes dilute and what constitutes concentration for a given solute and a given solvent. Well, we actually have five different ways in which we measure concentration. And here again, um, uploading the PowerPoint to Notability messes things up a little bit. So this should be number two, and this is A, and this is B, and we'll just get rid of that stuff. So we're gonna talk about molarity, percentage by both volume and mass, molality, and then parts per million, parts per billion, and we have even more than that, parts per trillion. And we can also talk about a mole fraction. Now, why do we have so many different ones? Well, it depends upon how you're going to measure the concentration. You're going to see that with molarity. You're going to also see it depends upon what is it that you want to know about concentration. That's especially true here. It also depends upon who you're communicating this information with. And of course, you notice that this word here has the word mole in it. Molality has the word mole in it. Mole fraction has the word mole in it. And how many ordinary people um, who have not had a chemistry class or haven't had one for a long time know or remember what a mole is? And so we need to have ways of measuring concentration that people are more familiar with, like percentage or parts per million, billion, or trillion. So let's look at molarity first. Molarity is defined as the number of moles of solute dissolved in a liter of solution. Notice that we're saying the word solution and not the word solvent. In other words, we do not have, in this measure of concentration, a precise measurement of the volume or mass of the solvent. All we care about is the overall solution, um, um, the volume of the overall solution. And that's very important for finding a very, very easy and convenient way of measuring concentrations. Probably the most common way that most people would use it in chemistry. So it's a very simple ratio. We have it, A equals B divided by C. And on a test or a homework assignment, if you're given any two of those values, you should be able to find the third. Now in chemistry, because we're talking about moles, very often when we talk about moles, 
we have to go from grams. And so I should actually write this here. So very often if we're solving for moles, then we can convert the moles into grams using the molar mass from the periodic table. Or if we're trying to find molarity or volume, we may be given the grams and we have to convert it into moles so we can use this formula. So that's a common modification of this um, equation. Now the nice thing about molarity, it's, it's very, very easy to measure using something called a volumetric flask. <coughs> we have many sizes of volumetric flasks. Dr. Barry uh, uses lots of them. We have gigantic three liter flasks. We have very, very small one milliliter flasks. Um, so the way in which we use them is we pick a flask that depends upon the volume of solution that you're going to need for your research or for um, a preparing a lab set up for a group of students. So let's say we want to make a half molar solution um, and we want a volume of that solution. How are we going to make it? Well, first of all, before we get into practicalities, remember we're going to use the capital letter M. Technically, it's supposed to be italicized when you see it in print, but if you're using it just in handwriting, uh, we typically we just use the capital letter M. We just write it because we don't, don't often, when we're doing handwriting, differentiate between making a capital letter M and trying to make it look italicized. I can't even do that. When you see it in print, though, it's usually italicized, capital letter M. You've got to be careful because so many things in science begin with the uppercase M, the lowercase M, um, the script M, the non-script M. You've got to keep it all straight. So the, way, the process that we do is we take our solute and we've ma masked this out on a scale, on a piece of paper, we know how many moles we want. We've converted the moles to grams. We put those grams on the piece of paper and we dump it into a volumetric flask. This is my volumetric flask. Um, that is going to be one liter because we wanted a one liter solution. Now, usually we have some water in here already. Maybe we fill it up halfway with water. And then we add my solute. This looks like potassium chromate, dichromate, because it's orange. And we add, in this case, we want to add half a mole, 0.5 mole, which we've determined previously by finding out how many grams in a mole and dividing by two to get a half a mole of our solute. And we dump that in. And then we can swirl it around because we've got this nice skinny neck that keeps it from spilling. And then we add some more water and add some more water. And then when we get close to the neck, we use a precise way of measuring water and we fill it up to this little line that's etched on the side of the flask. And so if you look very closely at these flasks, there'll be a little line that's etched here that will mark what happens when you get to one liter and somewhere often on a label on the side, it'll say at 20 degrees Celsius, or it might say at 25 degrees Celsius, depending upon the manufacturer. And people can do that very easily all over the place. If you get a job in college as a TA to help put, your, put you through school, and you can be relied upon to carefully and accurately measure molarities, um, that gives you an edge over any, anybody else for that particular job. So what effect does dilution have on the total moles of solute in a solution? Well, let's use an analogy. Let's so that, say that there are five guys in the classroom. So there's a certain concentration of guys in the classroom. Now, if a, bunch of, if a whole bunch of girls walk into the classroom, we've now diluted the number of guys in the classroom. But we still have five guys. We haven't changed the number of guys in the classroom. We've just made them a smaller um, proportion of the total number of students in the classroom. 
we've diluted uh, the amount of guys that are in the classroom, but we haven't changed the number of guys. That's what we do when we add, make a dilute solution. We don't change how many moles of solute um, that are in there, but the solute um, is found in a greater and greater quantity of solvent, and so it becomes more and more dilute. And we use this equation right here all the time. Dr. Barry uses it all the time. If you had a job as a TA in the chemistry department, you would use this all the time. And this equation basically says that molarity times volume, and some books are going to use the letter C for concentration in molarity times volume, equals concentration times mo um, volume. And the idea here is this is going to be, let's say, the concentrated, and this is going to be the dilute solution. Now, doing a quick dimensional analysis, you recognize that molarity or concentration is moles per liter. And so here's my molarity or concentration. And then if we multiply by my volume, my volume is in liters. And you can see that the liters cancel, giving me moles. And so in a sense, what we're saying in this equation is moles of solute equals moles of solute. It doesn't change. Moles equal moles. The number of guys in the classroom doesn't change just because we add more girls to the classroom. So there's your dimensional analysis check. And there are lots of times when you're going to use this. I'm going to get rid of some of this writing here. So if I, um, at the end of each school year or sometimes during the school year, I will order from a chemical supply company concentrated hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid or nitric acid or some other um, substance. And periodically during the year, we need to make dilute solutions for different labs. You've probably already used 10th molar hydrochloric acid and, or, and other solutions. Or maybe you've used 100th molar or 0.5 molar or 0.2 molar or 1.5 molar. You've probably used many different concentrations of the same kind of stuff. And, you, and how do we get these dilute solutions, um, do we order them all independently? And the answer is no. We order concentrated, which in the case of hydrochloric acid, for example, might be 13.6 molar, which would be the most concentrated hydrochloric acid you can get at ordinary room temperature. And every acid, for example, has a different maximum molarity. And then Dr. Berry just dilutes it down by adding water. So, for example, if I wanted to make a, um, if I, if Dr. Berry wanted to make two liters of one molar hydrochloric acid for an honors chemistry class, we come down here, and so she wants two liters of one molar hydrochloric acid solution, and the concentration of concentrated hydrochloric acid solution is 13.6. And so when she solves this problem, she says, I'm going to need X liters of 13.6 molar in order to create two liters of one molar hydrochloric acid. Now, she'll probably measure out milliliters. Um, so she's going to get uh, because that's a more precise way of measuring out the volume, she'll convert this number of X liters into milliliters by div um, dividing by 1,000. And we have lots of ways of measuring the volume of things very much more precisely than in a beaker or a flask. And so you have a burette right here, B-U-R-E-T, 
and it's calibrated. You can see if um, when you actually look at one, it's calibrated in the tenth of a milliliter. This thing down here is called a stopcock, or more generally, just a valve. And you turn the little handle, and you can let drips of liquid out and measure uh, and dispense a volume very, very precisely. You've already used graduated cylinders. We have many different sizes of those. Here's your volumetric flask. We have many sizes of those. And here is a pipette, sometimes spelled like this. Not the French spelling. So here is a student who's going to prepare 100 mils of 0.4 molar magnesium sulfate solution. And again, the upload to, to um, Notability uh, lost some of the features of PowerPoint, such as the subscripts. Now she has a stock solution of 2 molar magnesium sulfate. And that's the stock solution means she got it out of the stock room or the supply room. It also means that's how they keep this, this, this solution in stock. And it's often the way in which you might buy it from a chemical supply company. Um, and so you can, you can imagine what, she, what she's going to do in order to prepare this solution. So we have our volume times molarity equals volume times molarity, or molarity times volume equals molarity times volume. She wants to prepare... 100 mils of 0.4. So if this is my dilute side here, um, she wants to prepare 100 milliliters and of 0 0.40 molar. And you might say, well, don't I have to convert milliliters into liters? And the answer is technically no. If I keep my volume on the other side, x milliliters, if I keep these units the same, they're going to cancel out anyway, so I don't actually have to convert it into um, liters. And then the molarity of the stock is 2.0 molarity. And so I'll solve this equation for x by dividing both sides by 2.0. That cancels out, and you can see that 0.4 times 100 divided by 2 tells me how many milliliters of uh, stock magnesium sulfate, 2.0 molar solution, this student will have to pull up into the pipette, and here's a little device that will uh, pull the liquid up out of this beaker, precisely measured into this pipette. Uh, years ago, decades ago, they used to do this by mouth. You would actually suck on the, mouth, on the mouth of this pipette and pull the liquid up that way. And, of course, that creates a lot of problems and is rather dangerous. So now we have devices to do that. And you have one of these in the drawer in the lab. So the first thing she's going to do, she's going to transfer 20 mils to the 100 milliliter flask. And then she's going to add water. The, the 20 mils was the answer to the math problem. She's going to add water. And normally you put a certain amount of water in here, first of all, so that you have a reservoir for adding your solute. Then you add the, the magnesium sulfate in, and then you top it off with water to the, to the mark on the neck of the volumetric flask. Why do you begin with water? And the answer is because many times when you add a solute to a solvent, it's hard to draw with this pen, it produces heat. You have a heat of solution, a delta 8 of solution that is exothermic. And so you want that water to be in there in the first place in order to absorb that heat. Now, what about percentage? We can calculate percentage by volume or percentage by mass. And your volume can be in milliliters over milliliters or liters over liters, as long as you're consistent with the unit. And it can be in grams divided by grams or um, 
kilograms divided by kilograms if you're making a huge solution. And of course, a percent by solution is what most people recognize if they're buying it from the store. So here's a percentage by volume. If you look very, very carefully, right here, it's 91% by volume. That means that um, you have 91 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol um, added to nine milliliters of water for a total volume of 100 milliliters of solution. And that would be a 91% solution. Now, if you go to the store, to buy some isopropyl alcohol for the medicine cabinet because it is an anti, anti antiseptic, kills bacteria, antibacterial, it's also a sanitizer. You might say, oh, look, this one brand is cheaper than this other brand. I'll buy the cheaper brand. Well, you want to make sure you look at that number right there. The cheaper brand might be a smaller percentage of alcohol than the more expensive brand is, and that's because they don't have as much of the active ingredient. Here's another example of percentage by mass. And in this case, you can see that the active ingredient in bleach is sodium hypochlorite and NaClO, 6% by mass. And the rest of it are inert ingredients. And it's the chlorine, of course, that uh, is what kills microorganisms. And we're going to stop right there, and the next talk will be on colligative properties.